After sleeping on the conclusions gathered from his tour of the defences the previous evening, Percival called a meeting of all 11 of his commanders early on the morning of the 15th. The situation was bleak. There was less than a day's supply of 25-pound artillery shells remaining, while petrol and water were also predicted to run dry within 24 hours. Realising there was no alternative, and with the advice of his subordinates fresh in his mind, Percival finally agreed to capitulate. A decision ultimately made easier when a telegram from his superiors authorising surrender arrived shortly after. At 11.30am, a delegation of three envoys, including Major Cyril Wilde, a fluent Japanese speaker, set out in a staff car flying a white flag towards the front line on Bukit Timur Road. From there, they set out on foot into enemy territory before being picked up and taken to a nearby company's headquarters. Handing over a letter from Percival, they waited for an hour before Colonel Ichija Sugita arrived to give them Yamashita's reply. The Japanese commander flat out refused to travel to Fort Canning to discuss terms, instead insisting that the losing side come to his HQ, now situated at the Ford factory near Bukit Tima, to surrender. In addition, they requested that the British fly the Japanese flag from the top of the city's tallest structure, the 11-storey Cathay building, to signal that Percival had agreed to his request. The British left, arriving back at Fort Canning here at around 3pm. With the ceasefire expected to take place later that evening, this didn't leave the Allies much time to communicate their intentions to the frontline troops who were still involved in fierce battles with their counterparts. The Allies wanted hostilities to cease while it was still light, to avoid any confusion that could result in mass casualties. So time was running out. At around 5pm, Percival and his entourage of three arrived at the Ford factory, walking up the driveway carrying the Union flag and the white flag of surrender. The talks began around 15 minutes later and after some haggling over terms and a threat by Yamashita to launch a renewed assault, Percival finally gave in and signed on the dotted line at approximately 6.20pm local time on the evening of 15th of February. The ceasefire began a couple of hours later at 8.30pm when troops downed their weapons and the guns fell silent. Early the next morning, Japanese military police moved into the city to take control and survey the spoils of their victory. The victorious troops arrived later. The prize, meanwhile, was renamed Shonan or Light of the South, bringing down the curtain on 118 years of British rule. The loss, and more importantly, the manner of it, meant that the fall of Singapore went down as one of if not the worst military defeat in the history of the British Empire. And although it only proved a temporary change of stewardship, the ramifications of Britain's meek defence of its supposed jewel in the crown were huge for its empire in the post-war period. The immediate effects, however, were felt on the ground by both the local populace and the captured soldiers. The first to suffer were Singapore's Chinese citizens. The Japanese commanders commenced on a systematic purge of the Chinese community, known as the Soup Ching, or Purge Through Cleansing. Weeding out anybody they perceived to be anti-Japanese, the conquering forces screened tens of thousands of Chinese citizens in the space of just two weeks, beginning on February the 21st. Chinese males aged 18 to 50 were ordered to report to several centres around the island, such as this one at the Hong Lim complex for processing. The victors were chiefly looking for anti-Japanese elements, volunteer force members and communists, but others were selected on the most arbitrary standards, such as tattoos, their occupation and for giving the wrong answer to a simple question. Then. They were tied together, loaded onto lorries and taken to mainly coastal areas including Changi, Badok and here at Pungol, 
where they were executed. The exact number of people killed during the Suk Ching is hard to put a figure on. While the Japanese said later that around 5,000 people were killed, local estimates put the figure at anywhere up to 10 times that amount. The Allied troops, meanwhile, after initially being interred here at Changi Jail, also suffered greatly. From Singapore, thousands of Allied POWs were shipped off to various locations in Japan's new empire, such as Burma, Borneo, Thailand and Taiwan, to work as slave labour in mines or constructing railways and airstrips. Tens of thousands of them subsequently perished from malnutrition, disease, overwork, summary execution by guards and the appalling conditions they were forced to work under.